You know, as I put this talk together, I love actually sharing these secrets from Silicon Valley in places around the United States and in other parts of the world where innovation is rising. And the funny thing is, is I got to know this market, as I got to know a little bit about your story, TechSparks, got to meet some of you yesterday and learned about this amazing entrepreneurial scene that's rising in India, I realized I really don't have any secrets to share. You know, I think the things I'm going to talk about today, I think you're going to recognize. Largely, I believe you already know them. And what I want you to take from that, if there's one thing you take from this talk, is you probably, well, I said you knew them. You may or not have known them, but I'm sure you felt them. And my ask of you as we speak today is think about the things that you feel here or that you sense here and that you know intuitively are true. And remember that sometimes the way we talk about tech and about this digital world and all of the data can override that knowledge and make us think it's all about the stuff we do in our heads. It's not. Remember that there is so much more to this evolution, this revolution that we're creating together that is about all of us, our whole beings. And make sure you bring that, your own intention, your own empathy, your own emotional intelligence to tech. And I think you actually will hold a better secret even than Silicon Valley might hold so far. So with that on with the show, it's fantastic to be here. First, I want to say thank you so much to TechSparks and hello to all of you. What made Silicon Valley happen? You know, it's not what some people think. There wasn't a secret. It was a long, laborious process of people working hard, sharing a vision, building something together, iterating over time. Why hasn't it been replicated? That's something we're going to explore today. There's no formula where we could replicate Silicon Valley. It, it may be a focal point of the world, something we all look at, and certainly we've created some things there that I think are admired across the planet. But it's not only about that. It's about a long, slow building of a movement. Silicon Valley was not an overnight sensation. It was actually a very long time ago that it got started. You know, we look to Silicon, the chip, coming to Silicon Valley. That was in the mid-50s. But really, before that, there was so much more that happened. A show of hands, does anyone in the room recognize who these people are? This is the, you, good, great. This is the Traitorous Eight. It was a group of people, true entrepreneurs, who, they were traitorous, even think of the word, traitorous eight. They left Schlockley, which was a big technology lab in the valley, to start something called Fairchild, laying the roots for what would soon become Intel. And in fact, there's some people here that I'm sure you'll recognize when you see their names. But these were people who were really, these were, these were serious geeks. They were absolutely prepared to lead a revolution. There were eight of them, and six of them had PhDs. They were aged 26 to 33, having had deep academic training and then having worked hands-on with Shockley Labs. You'll notice some names here that are very famous. Who's heard of Moore's Law? Great. The acceleration of change. Aren't we all witnessing right now the acceleration of change? Gordon Moore, who you see right here, was the one who is credited with coining Moore's Law. Next to him, Bob Noyce, who is considered one of the fathers of Silicon Valley. He was one of the co-founders of Intel and a key person shaping the um, Intel and the microchip revolution. What made Silicon Valley happen? Well, before these two guys, oh wait, before these four people, because Hewlett and Packard started the company with their wives, Flora and Lucille. And in fact, Flora bankrolled the company, bootstrapped it as it got started. Why are you laughing? <laughs> it's true, but their story is lost in Silicon Valley. And in fact, here's something I want you to all join in wishing with me. One of my life goals is to write a story of what really happened in the late 30s when Hewlett Packard was founded by two husband and wife teams and how that story has gotten lost in the bigger story of Silicon Valley. But before these people got started, there was a legacy. We iterated. We built layer upon layer of small innovations that over the course of nearly 90 years, maybe even longer than that, created a community, an ecosystem that was focused on innovation. Something about the culture we built over time, over decades, gave people the confidence to innovate. It gave people the idea when they saw one good idea, if they added one aha to it, they could make it into a great idea. So in summary, Silicon Valley did not happen overnight. It was a long, slow build of an ecosystem of people working together, competing with each other, collaborating, learning, looking how something was done and saying, I can do that better. And if you think about that, that is one secret of Silicon Valley that is applicable to any innovation community. 
So it was not an overnight sensation, but yes, it was a unique confluence. Some things have come together. Academic base, we have UC Berkeley as well as Stanford right there in our community. We even have a technical college, very little known, that only focuses on four-year degree for hands-on technology and building. But we also had um, in access to investment. We had a long-term history of, of innovation in aviation, in radio technology, in oscillators and so forth that laid the foundation that we were able to grow from over time. And it was a one-of-a-kind experiment. This is really important to know. It was an experiment. It was an experiment that took more than 100 years. And none of us have time to, repl to replicate that experiment. It's now time for the next experiment to begin. So here's the first secret from Silicon Valley. It will never be replicated. And that's a good thing, because it's already happened. And it's happened with a certain focus. And there is so much more for innovators worldwide to focus on now. You know, when you think about Silicon Valley and you think about all that we've done, we have created something unique. But if you get kind of meta on it, in the same way it took decades for Silicon Valley to arise, layer upon layer, iteration upon iteration, now the world gets to iterate and, and be inspired in its own way and take what the Valley has done to its own next level. So important for global communities to look at this. And I know that here in India, all of you are looking to what India is capable of even beyond the Valley. Secret three I'm going to talk about right here, and this is something, if you look at this, this, this is a really interesting chart. It's from Australia, and what it's showing on the right side is the economic value of different industries in Australia. And on the left side, it's showing the disproportionate amount of investment that IT gets. If IT market is only this big, but the investment is going into it, what are the competitive opportunities for those entrepreneurs? How many Me Too products are in it? How many people are really doing the easy work of saying, aha, I can do that too, rather than taking that true empathy of what is possible, looking at problems and innovating around solutions? Secret three is we're not the end game. It's only just beginning. And in order to really begin, I think we can look far beyond IT to many of the things that are happening in the world, Internet of Things, even things in supply chain, in agriculture, in the environment, in food, in anything. There is so much open space to build and to really reshape industries around the world based on innovation and entrepreneurship. Here's a secret that I think is really important, and I think we could pay better attention to it back home. You can't do it for the money. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't huge financial value to be created through entrepreneurship. I think that you, know, you hear the companies that have been discussed today, in Infosys in the early days, um, Free Charge, all of these. They were, have created tremendous value through innovating, but you can't begin with that outcome in mind. And I think we lose sight of this in the Valley sometimes. This is why we have Me Too products and sometimes even Me Too funders. And based on what I've seen so far, that doesn't work out that well. The goal has to be to really change something in the world that you are so passionate about that you can't stop yourself from doing it. You know, early today, the speaker from Sequoia said that the only failure for an entrepreneur is not to try. You may win, you may not win financially, but you don't have a choice. Entrepreneurship is about something that you have to do. You can't not try. So the end game can't be the money. Secret five, questions, Trump answers. I think one of the most important things that we can remember as entrepreneurs is the problems have to be at least as powerful as the solutions. The more we understand the problems, the more we ask questions that help us understand who the audiences will benefit from our innovations are, the more we do that, the better our solutions will be. The more we'll be those category creators we all long to be. One of the things that was fantastic was Intel yesterday spoke about um, design thinking. In fact, I tweeted about it because I spend some time at the D School at Stanford, amazing place. I've gone through some workshops there, and I absolutely have seen a lot of presentations about design thinking. Yesterday's was the best I've ever seen. There is something so powerful in that understanding of only once you've engineered the solution do you dig deeper and really take that problem to the next level. One piece of, I don't know, a, a thought, one piece of illumination I'd love to leave you with is look at current solutions not as things to imitate or improve, but look at them to expose the gaps between current solutions and the problems. 
And that's design thinking. Let current solutions better illuminate what the real problems are. Then go back to the drawing board and begin again. So questions trump answers any time. Curiosity is an important theme. Nothing succeeds in entrepreneurship as curiosity, constant learning, challenging of assumptions, and thinking different. And let the problems lead the way even more than the solutions. Secret six, we need more than our heads to move ahead. Entrepreneurship is about transforming the planet. We're all doing it together whether we know it or not. There are huge changes taking place right now, and we are all part of them. But we can't do it if we're only looking at the data and the digital. We have to have empathy. We have to believe in what we're doing. We have to look at the people whose lives we're trying to improve, whether they're sitting at a desk or moving something across a continent or growing something from the ground up. The important thing is we have to really feel what their challenge is, what their problem is, and solve it with our hearts, our empathy, our inspiration, our spirits, and not only with the training we have in our minds. This is a really interesting picture to me. And in fact, has anyone heard of the term STEM learning, S-T-E-M, science, technology, engineering, and math? There's a lot of movement around STEM right now. I'm actually deeply concerned about STEM. I think it leaves out a lot that is really important to the creative process and to innovation. So I advocate for what's known as STEAM learning. You add the word art to the mix. And art can be the humanities. It can be actual the visual arts. It can be music. Many of the greatest designers in the world, developers in the world, work to music. Why? It stimulates their brains differently and helps them reach a flow state better. Steve Jobs frequently cited that one of his greatest inspirations as he looked at creating beauty in his designs was looking back to what he had learned about calligraphy. As we think about education, as we think about our own journey as entrepreneurs, make sure to bring art to your lives. Bring some steam to the work. The STEM is not enough. Here's secret seven. I truly believe that the next wave of value and impact will rise from a new wave of innovators. They won't be like the people we saw in the scenes of early Silicon Valley. This picture is one I really love. And it begs the question, who is the next Steve Jobs? And who is inspiring her? Let's look to different types of entrepreneurs and have the faith, the confidence, that it will be a new wave of people who are really creating that next wave of change. Now here's a secret that is true. It is different in the valley. We do think different. It's a different experience to be there, and it's probably because for more than 100 years, we have been immersed in a culture of entrepreneurship. There's some things that really set us apart that I feel really proud of. One of them is curiosity. You know, curiosity is a word I've been talking about with a lot of you here. But curiosity gives you insight. It helps you develop empathy. It helps you think different. This is where I say questions trump answers. And in fact, thanks to a few friends who've taught me here, I would say curiosity gives you the power to have a jugar. That beautiful insight that comes to you, that cleverness that lets you see something differently than anybody else has seen it. That is the superpower of being an entrepreneur. We also really believe in iteration. And I love this phrase from the box founder. And he goes, nobody ever got fired for buying X. Maybe some of us recommend that. It used to be a phrase that was about IBM, which is a very innovative company. But they said, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. And he goes, this is the first sign that X is about to stop innovating. Let's be aware of that. You know, we talk about the cash cows or something like that. The superpower of an, of, an, of an entrepreneur is constantly iterating and challenging assumptions about their own problem, their own project, their own product, never standing still, always thinking what comes next. Iteration is as important as curiosity. This is one of my favorite words in the whole world, and it's maker. Has anyone heard of the maker movement or spoken about? So making. Making is so important that we evolved as innovators working together to actually make physical things. We can't lose that tradition. And in fact, there's a big maker movement in the valley. Companies are very proud, you know, Google and Facebook and others, when they have print shops on campus, bike repair facilities, places where people can go and pound nails and saw things and break them apart or weld them and put them back together. The maker movement, especially those of you who have children, Make sure that your kids are not only dealing in the digital world, but they're hands-on putting things together. It's so important for our creativity, and it, it will actually fuel the creative process on so many levers, levels. Now, this is another favorite word, outliers. 
you know, people who think different. Um, and I think someone asked earlier today about the educational system. We talk a lot about some of the shortfalls in the education system back home as well. But the education system can often be optimized to make everybody think the same. We don't want people who all think the same. That's not how innovation happens. Let's not forget our outliers, and let's each embrace whatever little outlier thing we have in ourselves, or whatever big outlier thing we have in ourselves, because that is the talent that's going to set us apart. And you know this from Think Different. You have a great outlier here who changed the history of this country. So it's there in all of us. Secret nine. We need some help staying real in the valley. You know, we've become very self-referential. We often do technology for tech's sake. You hear a lot of these ideas, same people see, thinking the same. I saw a company last night, and a couple even at the hackathon, that are doing very interesting and very unusual things that I haven't seen back in the States. We are not put to that place of creativity because I think it's gotten a little bit too easy for us to turn to the obvious solutions in tech. So I really challenge India, I challenge all of you in this room, and I challenge global entrepreneurs everywhere to show us some things that we haven't thought of ourselves. In Africa, M-Pesa is completely outpacing mobile payments of anything that's been developed in the United States. Brick, a company out of Nairobi, providing global internet access no matter where you are, something that hasn't been delivered in the States. I love that Silicon Valley is seeing these examples of people who are eclipsing us, taking it to the next level, and I challenge and invite all of you to help accelerate that process because that will challenge us to do our best work too. And the phrase is, a rising tide lifts all boats. Here's secret 10, and you already know this. All of this is here, all of that curiosity, all of that ability to iterate, the understanding of, of history and what's happened, education, passion, drive, all of it. It's all here. And I, I found it so exciting being here in the last few days to see how well so many of you are putting your capabilities, vision, and talent to work to create something that has never been created before. And it's really that beautiful made in India movement. An entrepreneur said to me yesterday, and I, I really loved it, she said, um, that they don't want to be the next Google or the Google of India. They want to be something completely different that's never happened before. And I think it will be a very happy day for all of us when the Valley looks at a company that's been built here, maybe by one of you in this room, maybe by many of you in this room, and starts using it in a way that actually lifts us to a higher level. I know that day will come. This is happening in a lot of other places. We're all in it together. So the conclusion, and you already know this, if you're staring at the valley, you're missing the best view. An ecosystem of thriving valleys is so much better than one dominant one. And I'm so glad that you, the people of TechSparks, the people of India, are working to help lift these pockets of innovation beyond any one point in any one place. I think there's one more. OK, so we have to do this. No, it's not done. Wait a minute. One more thing. This is so important. Look to your thoughts. This was a very, very famous phrase. It's used by a lot of people over history. It's actually thousands of years old. I'd love to share it with you. It says, look to your thoughts, for thoughts become words. Look to your words, for words become actions. Look to your actions, for actions become habits. Habits shape character, and character shapes destiny. You know, the reality distortion field is real. When we believe something, when we think it, when we look forward and say, this is what is going to happen, rather than this is what has limited me or held me back in the past, when we look to our thoughts, we actually do shape our destiny. I know, I know that that destiny is going to take shape with the people in, these rooms, in this room. I'm going to be watching you, and you'll hear me cheering you on. Thank you very much. Thank you.